Hello, everybody. Thanks for um, coming. I'm Steve Goldman. I'm the director of the Center for Free Enterprise. And I want to welcome you to our second event of the Menard Family Lecture Center series. Excuse me. Um, so today's program is um, in collaboration with the um, Yum Center for Global Finance. And so I want to thank you guys for coming. But first, I would like to announce some upcoming events. On March 5th, in this auditorium, the Yum Center for Global Finance Excellence will I mean, what did I say? Finance. Man, I can't read the words in front of me. Sorry, sorry guys. <laughs> they all know what it is. So the Yum Center for Global Franchise Excellence will present Focus on Franchising, partnering with the University of Nebraska. They're gonna have four senior leaders. I think it's been flashing up here on the screen. Um, the CEO of Scooter's Coffee and the Chief um, Growth Officer of Authority Brands will be here. And then on April 2nd, the Center for Free Enterprise, along with the Young America's Foundation, will host North Korean defector Yanmi Park. And Yanmi um, came here in 2016, about a year after she finally got to the United States. And she's got a pretty good story. So um, you should come to both of these events. They're going to be really um, very good. Quick note, if you're here for cre class credit or reading groups or a cardinal flight program, there will be a QR code at the back on the door when you leave. And it will take you to a survey. You need to fill out the survey, give all the information about why you are here. If you're not here for that, you should still do the survey and give us some ideas of what works and what doesn't and what you might like to see in the future. So today we're going to discuss investing in communities where it makes a difference. And I know this sounds like a repeat of what I said last, at our last event, but I have a different ending. Um, I have students tell me when they graduate they want to help others. And that's very good intent. Tension. And I often tell them that if you're worried about poor people, open a business in their neighborhood. The way you get people out of poverty is you create wealth. And that's one way to create wealth is to, to open a business. And I think our event today is going to kind of hit on that. So I'm going to hand it off to Kathy Gosser, and she is going to um, introduce everybody and then do some Q&A. So thank, thank you everybody you. for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, it's so great to see you all here. I see a lot of our students, community members, and we really appreciate it. I am Dr. Kathy Gosser, and I have the pleasure of being the director of the Yum Center for Global Franchise Excellence, which is a real honor. But the best part are the two folks I have in front of me right now. So let me introduce them. Wanda Williams is the head of global franchising for Yum Brands. She comes from Dallas, Texas, and has an incredible background. She's worked everywhere, from a boxing agency, Continental Airlines, waste management, and has been at Pizza Hut, and now Yum Brands, for about eight years in a very, very senior role. She also is our key collaborator at the center, and we're so grateful for all she's done. And a little fun fact, she knows every single thing you can imagine about sports. So she watched, I promise you, my students who think that I'm a football fan, she puts me to shame. She knows all of them. So we're so uh, fortunate to have you, Wanda. Thank you. And then we have Mr. Damien Dwen, who is the founder and CEO of Lafayette Square, which is an investment firm with a twist. It is not a typical investment firm. And Damien's background is incredible. Starting out of college, he went to Georgetown. Starting out of college, he actually uh, started at Goldman Sachs, went to Credit Suisse, spent a ton of time at another um, private equity firm that you started. You were actually the founder of Brightwood Capital, which is incredible. Then you started Lafayette Square. And Lafayette Square has a very definitive reason for existing. And it's to impact, it's, a, it's an impact investment platform, very specific words, working with local partners to create an inclusive American economy. And one of the stats that you have that I love is that you invest 50% of your capital in underserved communities, which is what's going to make a difference. So we are so lucky to have these two um, speaking with us today. And I forgot to mention my friend and her law degree. So she also is very well educated, Miss Wanda. But I'm going to start with you, Damien, because you have a very interesting tool you're going to show us. Yeah. But first of all, can you describe for us what the impact of opening a business in an underserved community can do? Oh, well, look, it's, it's jobs, jobs, jobs. Um, but there's something more important than just employment. It's, it's, um, it's about wealth, it's about dignity, it's about the intersection of economic mobility and um, having a, a repeatable process. You know, a part of 
luxury of going to this great university, um, you're in a bubble, you're spoiled. And it's easy to lose context for what working class really means. Um, my dad was a bus driver. I grew up in DC. My mother worked 40 years in the federal government as a public servant. And um, I, I believed we were middle class. I think statistically, empirically, uh, at best we were working class. We were not middle class. But I, I felt very comfortable in the environment and had the privilege of a great education, private school education. So uh, even before Georgetown, I went to prep school. And after Georgetown, I worked at great investment banks. But the point is, it was never the real world. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the beauty of franchising and this broader conversation about uh, bringing capitalism to the working class with integrity is that we can have something that is repeatable, that gives people a sense of connection to their community, where you don't have to leave to build wealth. You can actually do it where you live. Uh, I do a lot of research for my job, and one of the stats that I'll share with you, which hopefully bothers you as much as it bothers me, we know in private credit, which is getting a lot of attention in the media today, more than 50% of the capital, and I'm talking hundreds of billions of dollars being deployed annually, more than 50% of the capital is invested in just five states. So if you're a business located outside of California, Texas, Florida, New York or Illinois, your access to capital is lower, your cost of capital is higher, and those structural impediments undermine vitality. My point to you is, if you're in Kentucky, the elephant in the room is the system is underestimating you. The system underestimates you. And if you're not angry about that, if you don't feel disrespected by that, you should. And I want you to use your power in this great education and this great ecosystem that we have at the University of Louisville. And let's actually fight back. And let's not, let's not fight back with negativity. Let's fight back with optimism that American capitalism can be manipulated to work for working class people. Mm -hmm. Let us center the working class. We have data to prove who's who and what's what. The question is, with that knowledge, what do you bring into the table? And I have a very simple three-part formula. I think you have to have capital, data analytics, and services. I think with those three things, capital, data analytics, and services, you can not only make a lot of money, you can take less risk, and you can make a difference in working class places and for working class people. Uh, so, you know, I come to this naturally because I feel like I'm a code switcher. You know, my dad, the bus driver who could schmooze anybody, and my mom, the nerd who sat there writing memos and negotiating for 40 years, um, set me on this journey where I got into the world and I realized, you know, the people, my peers at Goldman Sachs, we're not desperate to get to Kentucky. <laughs> you see where I'm going with this, guys? They want to get to the Hamptons, St. Bart's, right? Big boat, bigger plane. They were not thinking about this place and the human capital and the tradition and the power that rests in this community and how to use capitalism productively, sustainably, repeatably to create mobility. So that, that's what has me animated and very excited. I've raised a lot of institutional money from sophisticated investors who have heard the vision, and we're showing real results. But I've got a three-part formula, which is super critical. Like, you got to have proof. People have to taste it as well as feel it. That's right. And speaking of which, you know, it's one thing to talk about where should we invest. You've gone much further with your data analytics. And you said you'd give us a peek under the tent and show that. Would you mind? And then uh, I'm going to get to you, Ms. Wanda. Sure, sure. I'll, I'll, go, uh, I'll go fast. Um, but we, we built this tool, Potomac, with a, a simple goal. Um, you know, here we are in Kentucky. 
Um, I would say to you, you can learn a lot about the state from afar. You don't, you don't have to actually um, be here to know what's going on. Um, but what if we had a, a resource, a tool, that would allow you to very quickly visualize the state and then drill down into what's happening socioeconomically? Where are we on the low moderate income population, wages, racial mix, job openings, unemployment, FICO scores, households without internet, commuting times, life expectancy. Better still, what if we could drill down and focus on any element of the demographics of the place? Even seeing birth rates and who's living where and trends over time, how this all played out. Now the fun part to me is, I can tell you all this about Kentucky from afar, but in, Kentucky's a big place. I, I think counties matter more than just talking about the state. And frankly, if we really wanted to get clever about this, we could go down to the zip code level and using data science, analyze any collection of zip codes to compare and contrast and understand what's going on socioeconomically. For the students in the room, the reason this matters is as much as you are being taught about financial disclosure, revenue, cost of goods sold, margins, industries, cash flow, leverage, coverage, all this financial stuff, which is very important, I promise you, it's very important. It is all second fiddle to human beings. I've yet to encounter a business that makes money with no employees selling to customers who don't pick up the phone to complain. You have people on both sides. So imagine if you could use data science to anticipate, to predict the needs of your labor force, your human capital. Imagine if you could look at the communities that you will be serving your customers and see what's going on in Louisville is very different than what's going on in Beverly Hills. What's happening in Louisville is very different than what's happening in Dallas, Texas. With that knowledge, we can now customize that third leg of the stool that I talked to you about before, the services. Right? Money's not enough. You need money plus services. You can't get the services right if you don't have data science on your side to be analytical about coming forward with specific needs. So let me ask somebody in the audience, just, just call out a zip code. I don't care what you say, anybody. Just call out a zip code. 42701. 42701. By the way, you should see my team of nerds. You know what they had to do to create something that could render this that, that fast? Pretty good. All right, so I can tell you about this place, 42701. I've never been there, but I'm looking at um, an interesting place, a lot of young people. So clearly a place where you could raise a family. The median household income is a little bit below national average. It's got a decent sized population in terms of people of color out of 52,000, 10,000 are people of color. Uh, household size is 2.4 people. So that actually tells me um, there, there are a lot of working people. Percent rural is, is above average. Look at how the population spiked during COVID. It's a place people felt safe that they could retreat to. Um, that, that gets my attention. Uh, economically, you drill down and look at this place, a uh, lot of leisure and hospitality, a lot of people in education, a lot of administrative roles. Again, I've never been there, but you can see from an unemployment perspective, it's a scooch above national average, but for a long time it was, it was below the national average. And in terms of businesses in this zip code, um, there's not a lot of data, so it tells me it's, it's kind of a small place. I have to zoom out to the county that covers that same place. And finally, from a community perspective, um, big Hispanic population in that location. Hmm. Uh, and again, I, I would need to zip out to the, to the county level to, to go more on the community stuff. But my point is, I think the smart people in this room, the talent that is here, 
with this type of flexible tool to have that kind of information, um, I think you can make a bigger impact on the world. And I think you make better business decisions and actually take less risk and make more money. Because the big picture, the goal, in my view, has to be we fight against this system that sends half the money to five states. You know, Kentucky will never be California, nor should it be. So let's figure out how to make sure Kentucky gets its fair share of capital. And I can say the same thing about Arkansas, Georgia, the list goes on. What an interesting display. Thank you. Thank you, Damien. That is incredible to see the power of data. If you think about some of us who are not digital natives, some of those are in the room, but to see that's pretty incredible. Thank you for that. Thank you. Wanda, I'm going to jump out a little bit and talk about franchising, and then we're going to talk about the partnership you two have. But let's start with Yum Brands is the largest franchisor in the world. Um, 154 countries, over 60,000 restaurants, building 18 a day, opening 18 a day. Think about that. They're opening 18 restaurants a day. So can you share why Yum Brands decided to invest in the Yum Center for Global Franchise Excellence? Why education? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, like Kathy said, we have four brands, uh, Taco Bell, KFC, Pizza and Habit Burger. And we are the largest, but we believed we could do more. And what we started to see was that when new buyers were trying to get into franchising, they were bumping up against three challenges. So one was the lack of access to capital. Damien talked about that a little bit. One is, uh, the second one was lack of access to the right context at the brand to be able to understand what is the process, who do I need to speak to, and what I need to do. And then the third barrier to entry was the lack of access to franchising education. And so we knew that we weren't in academia, but we had a wonderful partner who had worked at Yum Brands for um, many years. <laughs> And she was already working here at the University of Louisville. She was already starting down the path to build this really robust franchising education. And we thought if we partnered, we call her Dr. G, with Dr. G, we could put this on steroids. And so we called up Dr. G and said, what would it take for us to take what you've already built and just propel it much further down the road and be the first university that offers three types of franchising education that is offered nowhere else in the world. And so with the support of the university, um, we were able to launch the Yum Center for Global Franchise Excellence. Um, it is wildly popular. Um, we have people ask us all the time, why U of L? Why not someplace else? Well, we love it here. They've given us great results. Um, we've seen many students graduate from the three different education tracks. Um, obviously, the franchising boot camp is one that we use internally to educate not only our employees, but obviously our franchisees and their employees. And now we're able to offer the franchising boot camp in Spanish, which is huge. It is now able to reach larger pop, uh, parts of the population across several countries. Um, we're launching a new program uh, that was announced today called Accelerating Growth with U of L, and that will help us help our franchisees kind of build up their internal pipeline so that the next set of uh, franchise owners can be built within their own organizations and ensure that they have succession plans. Because we say all the time, just because you start in the restaurant doesn't mean that's the last place you're going to work. Many of our franchisees started off working in a restaurant, made their way up to restaurant general manager, then to area coach, then to district manager, then to vice president, then to president. And we have a gentleman that um, owns KFCs. He started off running two. He owns 1,100. He also owns several hundred Taco Bells and several hundred Arby's. So when people say to me, why do you work there? Do you work in a restaurant? I do sometimes, and that's okay. But I've never seen so many men and women that are billionaires in my life, and I wish somebody would have told me, Same. coming out of college, that there was another pathway other than corporate America, which is the path I followed, which it's not a bad path. But the ability to be able to build in your own community, to hire people in your own community, to create a sense of family across all your stores and all your team members, and to empower someone who may never have gone to school, they may not have graduated from high school, but one day they can be a billionaire, there's no better American dream than franchising. So just really proud to be a part of the industry, 
proud to bring academia into the industry to make sure we can make more people aware of the industry and the power it can bring and the ability that it can um, help families create generational wealth. So. And that is our goal, is to create generational wealth through franchising. Which you may be wondering, why do I have these two amazing professionals together? We're going to talk about that, exactly why. So Wanda talked about a lot of understanding franchising is awareness as well as education, but it's also capital. So Wanda leads the franchise office, and they're very interested in getting as many different people, as many representative people into franchising as possible. So how do you do that? Well, you have to make it. You have to make people aware. You have to obviously educate. But guess what? It takes money as well. Let's let's be honest. It does take some money. So Wanda and her team, are, who are, some of them are here as well, welcome, are very very um, entrepreneurial when it comes to what can we do. So she partnered with Lafayette Square with Damien, and the two of them have created a plan that I'd like you to talk about. The one that was launched, I think, about a year ago, the fifty million dollar plan. If you yeah. all would talk about that and why that came to be, bringing these two worlds together. Well, I mean, there's you can see Damien's amazing, so. There's no uh, wonder why. But I, I remember I said there were three things that were barriers. Lack of franchising education. We knocked that down by partnering with the University of Louisville. The second thing I said was the lack of access to capital. Now, typically, when you buy a deal across any of our brands, and also typically within the restaurant industry, you put a certain percentage down as equity. So that's the money you're bringing to the table. And the balance, you finance. And so what we were seeing were a lot of new people coming into the industry. We can talk about the part that they're bringing to the table. If they didn't have that, they couldn't get access to the financing. And so when I met Damien and I expressed this problem and he said, look, I invest in, um, you have, I have an impact-based fund and we invest in underrepresented communities that are creating jobs and offering services Franchising is a sweet spot for me, so how can we work together? I said, look, I'm having a challenge when someone says, hey, I'm leaving my job to now open a KFC, and I can't get anybody to give me financing, and the financing APRs are so abusive, I'm not gonna be able to do it. So I said, Damien, let's partner together and figure out a way to shut that down. Let's make sure that another door is open and not shut by providing them access to debt financing. So I'll let Damien explain to you the part where he came in and what he provided to our Franchise Fast Start program. Sure, th thank you, Wanda. Um, first thing is we wanted to make sure Wanda knew the people that we know. So we've introduced her to a steady stream of talented operators with a history in the franchising space who want to get closer to young. Uh, Wanda's very popular. People want to get close to her. So. Um, it, it actually has not been that hard for us to try to find interesting groups. <laughs> the other thing is people, people need money, particularly during a, a credit crisis when regional banks aren't lending the way they used to and when the large private credit shops are really focused on California, Texas, Florida, New York, and Illinois. And specifically, private equity controlled businesses in those places and bigger and bigger companies. Now, I want to unpack that because if that felt like Kentucky was not mentioned, <laughs> it wasn't. That, that's exactly what I'm saying, guys. Mm -hmm. This is a system, and if we don't confront it, left to its own devices, it will conspire against you. It will take food off of your table, and it will treat you as second class. Just wanna really repeat the point. Without confronting this system, it will treat everybody in this room, in this state, as second class. The system is designed for private equity firms to do bigger and bigger deals in places that are not here. And I take offense at the whole concept. I reject it. So I can be the exact same guy I was trained to be at Goldman Sachs, taking the exact same type of risk and separate myself from the pack because I'm prepared to come to Louisville and have a good time. Think about it. Like, this is not even rocket science. It is a revolution to say I'm glad to do business outside of five states. So the pitch is I'm a conservative, classically trained investor. 
I do my due diligence. I'm not going to take stupid risk. But the notion that I can make capital available in this place makes me six inches taller, body fat comes down, <laughs> fast twitch muscles, right? Because it's all about place. It's all about place. So we are, we are thrilled that Yum, and, and this came out of a meeting that Wanda facilitated with their CEO, he very quickly said, listen, Lafayette Square is committed to investing at least 50% of its money in working class places and in businesses that employ working class people. And you have a bunch of capital that's terrific. You're a natural partner for us because guess what? Most of our employees are working class people. Most of our stores are in working class places. Most of our customers are working class people. We are a working class shop. Mm -hmm. So to have a capital source that is not looking to abuse our customer base or our employees or the communities where we do business, but actually wants to try to retain and grow jobs in that place, and has an incentive to bring capital at reasonable prices, as Wanda alludes, that's, that's a partnership that makes sense, that's value add. But I ask you in your mind, think about the great financial firms that you read about in the Wall Street Journal or the Financial Times, and how many of them are banging down your door to do business in places that you know are fundamentally working class. So that's, that, that's the vision and the pitch, and that hopefully gives you context on why there was natural alignment. When Wanda and I discovered each other, we were, we were fascinated by the notion that there were others like us with access to power and resources who didn't want to sell out to doing business as usual. And I would say to you as just a final point, because I'm a capitalist, right? I, like, I like money. <laughs> it is less risky and I can get better returns by being the kid my family raised me to be. Mm, that's awesome. That's awesome. And then um, two other things. So that was the first um, program that form formed the partnership, which is the Franchise Fast Start program, where Lafayette Square is committed $50 million in debt financing. So basically access to that as deals come along. So you remember I told you there's two components to secure a deal. There's the debt financing, which we just talked about, and there's the equity, which is the money the brand expects the buyer to bring on their own. Now, when you first go out to get a franchise the very first time, everybody doesn't have a 401k, everybody doesn't have access to stock, and everybody doesn't come from a wealthy family. So when you look to buy one store, two store, three stores, and somebody's asking you for a half a million dollars, where do you get it from? So the second thing when we talked about lack of access to capital that we noticed is we have really committed people that can operate stores that we fundamentally want to bring into our business, but they just don't have the personal wealth to purchase a deal. So the second thing Damien and I said is, well, we got to fix that too. So um, more to come, but we are working on a living facility that will uh, allow new buyers to basically have access to grants to cover that portion of the deal, which will then in turn allow you to go get the debt financing. Because once you can show you have the equity, you can then go get the debt. So that's the second program we're working on. The third program we worked on together is um, combining Potomac, which um, Damien walked you through, and overlaying our sales and transaction data by franchisee, by brand, to understand what are the insights that are telling us how the community is changing, whether that's growing or shrinking, if the community is employed or unemployed, and how that impacts our traffic and how we price. So it's a smarter way to run our businesses, which makes our franchisees more healthy and our team members more secure because their restaurants are thriving and growing. And then the fourth way we're working with Damien is he talked about services. So the one thing that's really tough these days, no matter what business you're in, um, is keeping people, right? Labor's tough to come by, and that's for any business. 
So we just wanted to make sure we could help our franchisees create more stickiness to keep the people working in their restaurants. And so there's always the dollar game, right? Where McDonald's can pay a dollar more or Arby's can pay a dollar more and you just run out of dollars. So you have to figure out what other benefits you can bring to your team members to give them more security in a sense that this is the place I need to stay. So we worked with Damien and his team and we provided two benefits to a uh, pilot group of about a thousand stores. And we did two things. We um, helped them understand more about financial literacy through gamification, which was much more interesting than them learning from about financial literacy through a book. And then the second thing we did was we helped them increase their credit score by um, looking at and tracking their on-time rent payments and that was um, able to then generate stronger credit scores, which then allowed them to do what? Get a car, secure housing, you know, do, do everything you want to do when you have a strong credit score. So it's a non-traditional way of increasing a credit score by doing something they do every day. So those are just some examples of how we've grown the partnership in about a year and a half. Um, and we're, we're not running out of ideas. We probably have a few more we can come up with. Oh, I know that for sure. I've seen that. I've seen that engine work. <laughs> but you know, I think one of the things you said, I want to reiterate, it is difficult to start a franchise. And many of you all, my students have said, gosh, I'd like to, but it would take so much capital. And I think what you're talking about, and I know it hasn't been secured yet, but think about when you buy a house, you usually have to put 20% down and then you borrow 80%. That's kind of like with a franchise, except you really have to have the 20%. You really can't some, somehow get another loan for that. You have to have it. So what you're talking about, if I hear you right, if this, if this deal goes through, is that could be a grant. A grant meaning not paid back. To help folks, first time franchisees, really become franchisees, make a difference in their communities. How amazing is that? That is incredible. So congratulations, um, the two of you are doing wonderful things. It's just, it's amazing. Well, I wanna ask you, Damien, and, and you too, Wanda, one of the things that, and you talked a lot about, and the, whole, the five states thing really does ring true, but private equity loves franchising. Franchising has been the darling of private equity. Why? Cash flows are predictable. Mm -hmm. uh, credit markets understand it and are prepared to put up the leverage. You know, private equity guys are not complicated. They want steady and predictable, and they want things that are financeable. My, my problem with the industry and the way it behaves is it does not connect the dots on human beings and communities mm -hmm. and what happens when you just flip businesses and you hire and fire people because you just view them as an input. That's, that's, that's my issue. Um, I think if we could come up with a system of capitalizing franchises with um, money that has a longer time horizon than just mm -hmm. seven to 10 years, mm -hmm. so that you really can, because you know, nobody thinks about running their community with a seven year horizon, right? We're thinking about the community for decades, centuries into the future, how to make choices that uh, our children and grandchildren would be proud of. And so that sense of stewardship in the cap table of these businesses is sometimes lacking. And it shows up in short-term thinking in terms of reinvesting in the business instead of taking cash out. And you should be pouring more money into upgrading training and development, making sure you have better customer experience. Think about your boat in the Hamptons. That, that's my problem with how private equity shows up sometimes. Um, I think the best operators, of course, do have the lowest cost of capital by entities that have really steady cash flows and of course bring operational improvement. Uh, that is rare air, I'd say that's 10% of the lot. 90% mm -hmm. of the people don't make it there. Mm -hmm. The cost of capital is higher, they're not particularly great operators and they're just trying to flip. Uh, and the Federal Reserve taught us all a lesson in the last 24 months. They can move rates 500 basis points in a year and shock the system. You don't want to be on the wrong side of the government. So mm -hmm. you have to have that long-term view where you have the operational excellence and you have capital that can run for miles and miles. That's why it's really important you pick investors who have fun vehicles. 
they're not hot money. They need to have you know long long duration. So you all are doing a lot for people and, and changing the face of franchising, changing the face of investing. Why? What drives you? I mean, why not? I mean, we, we serve food, but we're in the people business. Mm -hmm. Damien invests money, he's in the people business. The way this world works is with people. Um, and that's why we get up every day and do what we do. Our, our team members aren't just the restaurant workers, they're our family. So I think if you want to work in franchising, you have to have a strong passion, not only for the business, but passion for people. It is a people business. You are, your customers are people. Your suppliers are people. The people you pay your rent to. I mean, like, it is a people business. And I think we forget that sometimes um, because we're in the service industry. But the people who are successful, our franchise owners, are very focused on who works for them and making sure they feel secure, they feel safe, and that their quality of life is high. But I'll let you. Uh, I, just to echo Wanda's comments, look, the biggest opportunity for me, I'm 48 years old. Um, the biggest opportunity for me for the remainder of my business career is to put up a report card that shows I can make money in Kentucky taking less risk than if I had done business in California or Texas. Because right? the elephant in the room is there are a bunch of people with money and power with no research who have already concluded what I just described is not possible. So my big opportunity is to put up numbers performing in working class places and with working class people and disclosing the results, being transparent about the data, the good and the bad, laying it all out. And if my report card shows I cracked the nut here and we had success together in this community and communities like this, that that to me is energizing. People want to work at Lafayette Square because of that call to arms. And I actually think it's a pretty safe bet. You just need to fight. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the opportunity to just show up in our communities with the types of resources that Wanda described will be revolutionary. And when she says we're all in the people business, I want to be just a little bit more specific with the concluding point. There are five things that I'm hell-bent on disclosing as we put money to work in places like this community. The five things, wages, turnover, healthcare adoption, retirement benefit adoption, job training. In my view, you should trust no one with money who will conveniently not disclose those five things with the same speed that they would disclose IRR, revenue growth, financial leverage, financial coverage, EBITDA margins. I'm saying to you, all that financial disclosure is great. The human capital disclosure is on par. And that package is reflective of the character of the people that I've encountered in my partnership with Yum and why together we are excited about franchising as a mechanism for wealth creation and communities everywhere, but particularly in working class communities. Ah, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Well, before I ask for questions from all of you, you have the opportunity. You have some bright, amazing students. I happen to think we have the best students anywhere here at the University of Louisville. What advice do you have for them as they start on their careers? I would say just remain passionate about what you do, whatever you choose, and investigate things you don't know a lot about. Uh, like I mentioned, when I graduated, I didn't know about franchising. I would go to the restaurant and I just thought they make food and somebody big owns them. <laughs> There's individual men and women who own the restaurants you go to that are taking care of their families, raising their team members' families, Look into things that you don't know a lot about and don't assume because you frequent a place that you know how money is made at that place. Excellent. Nothing sells like the truth. Nothing sells like the truth. 
Um, just figure out something that is true and ride that pony. You know, I would say your entire academic career, all the beautiful relationships that you built on campus, it's, uh, it's, it's incredible, you're privileged, but you have to have some intellectual integrity and find the truth. And I think you can, you can make a difference in the world and make a lot of money at the same time. Nothing sells like the truth. Well, I know that's music to a lot of my students' ears who are, the money is top of mind. So thank you for that. Well, I think Dr. Goman, are you around? Would you like us to, to take some questions? Did you have another question you'd like to ask? Uh, and be thinking, you all, because we're gonna we have a few minutes for questions. Yeah, th thank you. I think this presentation's been great, and I, I like the the point that you guys have been making that that people are the most important thing, and and, and I think. The students need to realize that, that businesses that succeed in the long run look at the long run and not the short run. And it, it's the way people lead their lives. It's, you do the same thing in business. You care, you care in the long run. So I guess I don't have a question, but, um, but I appreciate you guys making that point because I think it's important. And, and in the true capitalist sense, true capitalists care about the long run and they do the right things. And, and so. Um, Keep up the good work, and I'm excited to see what, what happens with you guys in the future. So if anybody has questions, you need to come up to these two microphones, and you can ask, and um, definitely ask them questions. A big thing for you guys as students, <coughs> go and meet them afterwards. Networking, meeting people is going to open doors for you, and, and these guys will help you find some doors. If you don't knock on any doors, you don't get anywhere, so mm -hmm. take advantage. Come up and ask some questions. Do we have a, do we have? Yeah. Oh, awesome. So, um, you, you talked and mentioned how all of the, or 50% of the, more than 50% of investment capital is going to five states. What structural changes would you like to see to change that? Or are there any structural changes? Does it have to be on the individual level? Or is this built into the system that could be changed a little bit to get both better um, returns and investments to people who don't have it right now? Can I, can I make it spicy? <laughs> Go right ahead. So, um, my, my uncle died last week. My, my beloved Uncle Marlon, he was great. He was a bus driver. Um, I'm his only heir. Uh, I found out on Friday night, flew home to Washington. He's a bachelor, good looking guy. <laughs> and, um, I kid you not, a girlfriend broke into his house because it was a wellness thing. and The neighbors were there and the bottom line is he passed. And um, I bring it up because he was from a small town in East Texas. He built a career as a bus driver. He left me his house, which is like a million dollar house in, in DC. Was, the neighborhood was black and working class. Today it's gentrified. House has gone up in value. His house needs to be fixed up because he didn't take care of it the way the neighbors did. He has a, a pension, and some life insurance. But would you believe that my uncle, despite all the things he taught me, and you can imagine the types of conversations we had growing up, he supported me financially in college in particular, but he's just always there for me. He's my uncle. 65 years old, he passed away. When you lift the hood, my uncle exported his capital to California, Texas, Florida, New York, and Illinois. So my spicy, provocative, structural reform is Kentucky needs to stop sending its money to California, Texas, Florida, New York, and Illinois. If you challenge the chief investment officer or the treasurer of the state, if you confront the investment committee who runs money for the teachers here at the university, you would find they're exporting their money. So I want to change the balance of payments. I want to keep some percentage of Kentucky dollars in Kentucky to create Kentucky economic mobility. I think money talks. 
So the best thing that could be done to fight against this movement is we have to get people with money and power, interestingly, who often don't pay taxes, to keep some amount of the money at home and get rid of this disrespect that um, as fiduciaries, they have to seek returns. And the only place to get returns are in those five states. I reject it. And interestingly, the same people who make these claims, when you challenge them to provide statistics, conveniently are busy and can't come up with the numbers. The facts are hidden in plain sight. Money is being exported from this place and places like it. I want to see it stop. But I'm taking the first step. I've got to prove I can make money here. The more I prove the point that I can make money here, the less air in the balloon of these excuses made about exporting capital from the place. Good question. Thank you. Thank you for that. We have another question before I call on someone. You got a young question. This is great. We do. Excellent. Um, so what were the three problems people run into when starting a franchise? Yes, uh, lack of access to capital, lack of access to franchising education, mm -hmm. and lack of access to the right contacts at the brand to understand how to secure a deal. Okay. Okay, I can't wait for you to Thank apply. Thank you, yeah, yeah. That would be awesome. Looks like we have another one coming up. Is it possible that you could talk about some of the success stories that you've had? Me or Damien or both? Either separately or together. Yeah, so like I said, when we ran the uh, worker solution pilot, um, we ran it in Mississippi with a pizza franchisee um, we ran it across about a thousand um, team members, uh, several hundred stores, and we were able to increase out of everyone who participated, where we were tracking their on-time rent payments, 60% of their credit scores. So that allowed a lot of those team members to buy a car for the first time, and a few were able to buy a house. So that's why benefits matter, and that's why if you really care about your community, you have to offer something more than pay. So there's that. Um, when I talked about this new living vehicle that will cover the 20%, which is the um, equity side of what you have to bring to a deal before you can get the debt, um, we are working on building that vehicle and we have 10 deals pending. So 10 people with actual franchising deals that are on hold because they can't bring the 20% that will change their lives and their families' lives. And then every day we look at deals. Our deals take a long time. They're like an eight to 12 month process. So we have deals in the pipeline that will be leveraging the franchise fast start, which is the debt financing side of the coin. So we're really excited about that. And then we're bringing to life Potomac, which is the platform you saw with all of our franchisee data. We're gonna use Pizza Hut first. And then we're gonna work with the large Pizza Hut franchisees to understand what can they do differently to not only better serve their customers based on what we know about the community, but also to make sure their business is as healthy as possible? And then is their pricing positively or negatively impacting? Are you really situated in the right part to serve the bulk of the community or do you need additional stores? So we'll be bringing new news to our franchise owners that they don't have access today because Damien's platform is real time. A lot of the information we buy today is static. So once the community is pivoting on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, we have no idea. We're looking at last year's report. So now we'll be operating in real time. So hopefully that was helpful. That's brilliant. The only thing I would say is um, I'm riding with Wanda. And every 90 days, I'm publishing on the SEC's website our performance. Mm. So my response to you is the answers are already hidden in plain sight and there's more coming. 
I'm super excited about March when we file our Form 10-K, which is an annual requirement for SEC registered investment advisors like, like me. And the data will be right there in a 150-page document with you know signature from my auditor, Ernst & Young, and I'm saying it to the government and the world. I think we gotta ride that, that edge of disclosure. Let's be transparent, let's be upfront, and the twins, financial disclosure and human capital disclosure, together, uh, is something that to me is gonna be very energizing because historically people have tried to downplay this stuff and tiptoe around it and obfuscate it, and we need to lay it, all, lay it all out. Excellent, excellent. Any other questions? Oh, and oh, we do. Dr. G produces a report for the center every year that you're also able to see all of our results with the University of Louisville. So we're very proud of it. We present it to our board of directors every year. Um, we present it internally. So uh, the truth is hiding in plain sight. Excellent. Hey, thank you all for being here today. Um, I really like the point about the credit card payments because I just started doing that recently. and I had no idea that every time I paid rent, my score could go up. And it's sort of a big sort of structural uh, advancement you can make for people. And I was curious if you all, you know, sort of branching out of that are interested in, you know, environmental conditions for workers or even like infrastructure to get to the businesses. Um, is that something you all consider or is that just like a little bit like a layer up that you aren't, that you all aren't too focused on yet? Yeah, so the, in the U.S. the government is um, actually enforcing some laws where you have to do more reporting on recycling. Um, so that is a big push internally. What's interesting is I worked on that side of the business prior to coming mm -hmm. to Yum, and it's hard to control where your trash goes. Because when people leave our rest, they're not eating on premise as much as they are taking it somewhere else. So our trash usually ends up in your friend's house, at the gas station trash can, here at the university, and so you have to make sure you have the infrastructure to support the activity, meaning if you don't have enough recycling that is offered, meaning every place, house or business, everything can't get recycled. If you don't have organic recycling plus traditional recycling, you can't recycle something that has a food stain on it. So I think we have more of an infrastructure problem in the US that has to be solved so that every business can do the right act. So I don't know if that's helpful, but we're doing our best to understand how can we use more recycled content in our packaging, how can we just produce less waste. We have a program at each of our restaurants where we recycle food that hasn't been eaten because there's somebody that can eat it. The food's not bad. So at the end of the night, we have an agency that will come and collect all the food that wasn't sold or used and take it and donate it so somebody can be fed. So we're thinking through ways as to how to do better, but we need the support of the infrastructure, which will fall on the governments, both local and national. Excellent. Yeah, the only thing I would compliment is to say, if one of our borrowers adopts the types of services that Wanda has described, we would actually give them an interest rate reduction on the loan. Hmm. So our message is, if you do the right thing, you're, you're safer. It's a less risky investment we're aligned, you should be rewarded with a lower cost of capital. The adoption of services, I think, is gonna be one of the big revolutionary things in credit investing. Uh, people shouldn't have to pay 10% if they're doing things that really make them more of a 9% risk. Let's find a way to have a sliding scale based on actual services delivered that are relevant to the big five I mentioned before, especially turnover, healthcare adoption, retirement benefit adoption, those three, you know, we got to go deeper and do better. Um, there's an environmental overlay that we can add into that mix, but all of it can be tracked and measured. And when people, management teams, do the right thing with their workers, they should get cheaper funding. Thank you. That's awesome. awesome. I think we have time for one more. We have in the back. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Well, Louisville prides itself on its locally owned and small businesses here. So what? arguments would you have to arm those who understand and support franchising to those who contest that franchises are actually going to hurt underserved communities? So we haven't seen a restaurant open that didn't create a job. If not one, multiple. 
We haven't seen a restaurant open that didn't give back to their community. And we understand that people have to eat. So I'm not really sure what the argument to that would be. Um, I think people assume, and I hear it all the time, mm -hmm. that the franchisee is the brand. It isn't. The franchisee is a working class man and woman coming from the community. So that's why I challenge the students to look into it a bit deeper because if you really understand who is running the store, it is not the brand you see on the door. So I think it's a lack of education, which is why through the center, we are continuing to educate folks about what is franchising? How does it really work? How does it really improve the community? How are these local men and women offering more jobs, giving back to their community, providing a pathway to generational wealth? So that's what I would say is, come take our class. <laughs> yeah, love thank that. you. Love that. Thank you, thank you. Well gosh, thank you all so much for being here and enlightening us with some incredible information. Thank you audience for being here, we really appreciate it. I wanna point out a good friend of mine, Ms. Gina Tobin has come. She is the president of Texas Roadhouse. I think you all are familiar with that. Yes. So we got some great folks in the audience, lots of great students. Thank you all so much for coming. Steve, I'll let you wrap us up. Yeah. Bring us home. I think uh, we've got some, some gifts for you. Yeah. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Wonderful presentation. Thank you students for coming. Hope you make the next two events, the one for Young, young and one for uh, Center for Freedom. Yes, join us. Thank you guys.